Hi, my name is Chris Mitchell, and I'm a Cloud Solution Architect with Microsoft's Global Partner Solutions Team. In today's vignette, we're going to be looking at cognitive services and how you can operationalize calls to cognitive services as part of a data pipeline in Synapse using the Synapse ML libraries. So first thing we're going to do is look at what is Synapse ML, look at what Azure Cognitive Services are, and then we'll jump into the demo showing how you stitch these two things together. And we'll wrap up with a summary of some additional supplemental resources you could look at to find out more information about this. So first of all, what is Synapse ML? Uh, this is a project from Microsoft um, that is fully open source, and it's designed to help uh, make it easier to operationalize uh, common machine learning and artificial intelligence patterns uh, within Spark. Um, it's designed to be simple to use and highly scalable, and it takes the framework of uh, machine learning capabilities that are built into Spark and extends it to leverage a lot of common machine learning frameworks that go beyond what Spark offers out of the box. Um, as part of this, it includes uh, transformers to execute calls to Azure Cognitive Services, which are run outside of the Synapse platform, but it makes it easier to use. And the most important thing to call out is though that even though it's called Synapse ML, it's actually not limited to running just in Synapse. This will run anywhere where Spark runs. This could be uh, an HD Insight cluster, it could be Databricks cluster, or even in a Docker container. So anywhere where you can install and execute the Spark libraries, uh, you can run uh, Synapse ML. Now the thing that we're going to focus on today is specifically how to use this with cognitive services. So looking at cognitive services, if you haven't seen this before, uh, cognitive services are designed to be pre-built artificial intelligence models that, uh, that are developed and distributed by Microsoft. Um, and these are made designed to solve really common artificial intelligence problems that have broad reach but are also very complex. Um, and typically require lots of training data to build and, and customize. Um, uh, you know, this could be things uh, like uh, language detection, being able to do things like speech to text, text to speech, um, could be common patterns like uh, uh, OCR, object character recognition, so being able to take an image that detects text out of that image, um, and then also doing things like image classification. Um, so these, these services are both pre-built in, in many cases, or also can be customizable via something called transfer learning. And it'll take uh, a set of images that you provide it and then be able to train a custom classification model on images as one example. And so this is a pretty rich, diverse set of APIs that are put out there and uh, distributed by Microsoft that are targeted largely towards developers that need to be able to take advantage of these common ML patterns as part of their applications. Um, but they might not necessarily have the volume of data training data necessary or the time to train custom models themselves. So basically it enables you to tap into uh, this rich e ecosystem of Azure intelligence, artificial intelligence from any application that you have. All right, and so here's just an example of some of the cognitive services that are available for you to use today. Um, we're not going to go into all of these. Um, this is just the idea to give you some of the really complicated problems that we can solve using these Azure cognitive services, like I mentioned, image classification, being able to look at a business form and um, extract data from that business form, uh, being able to do things like uh, transfer speech to text, and a couple of things that we're going to look at specifically today here is we're going to be looking at translation services. So how do we take data that's coming in that's in one language and translate it to another? And then also how do we look at uh, a body of text and detect the sentiment of that text? Um, that's what our demo is going to focus on today. But just know that um, Synapse ML has uh, transformers for all of these uh, cognitive services um, so that if there's a specific business problem that you need to need to use, uh, the Synapse ML is designed to make it easy for you to do this as part of your Spark jobs. All right, so let's jump into the demo. Before we go into code and into the Azure portal to look at these things, I wanted to call out really quickly the components that are being used in this demo. Um, this is the conceptual architecture that shows the components that are play. And in the interest of time for our demo, I've pre-provisioned all these resources um, so that you don't have to watch the configuration process. However, in the GitHub companion repo for this talk, 
I've actually shared uh, step-by-step instructions on how to provision this in your own demo environment because there's a few things that you're going to have to do in order to make this work. Um, a few notable things here to talk about um, are application identities. So Synapse um, has an application identity that it runs under and uses this identity to access resources. So when you provision a Synapse environment, you're going to have an option when you provision this Synapse environment to also provision a storage account to go with it. So at provisioning time, if you choose this path, um, it will automatically provision uh, the application identity and grant that application identity access to the underlying storage to make it easy for you to, to stitch these things together. If you need to use an alternative storage account, you're going to actually need to grant the application identity from Synapse permissions to the storage account um, in order to make this work. Um, also, um, in order to talk to Cognitive Services, um, Cognitive Services uses a key scheme for authentication. So when you make a call to Cognitive Services API, you need to pass the key along as a bearer token um, for it to authenticate your request. Now, we could have shown you taking this key and just hard coding the key in code, but it's never a good idea to store sensitive secrets like keys in your code. Um, so for this demo, we've actually leveraged Key Vault in order to illustrate the more appropriate way to do that. So obviously, we've taken the secret, we're storing it in Key Vault, well, Synapse needs to be able to fetch that um, from Key Vault. So this is another area where the application identity comes in. And so we've actually granted the Synapse application identity list and get permissions on the Key Vault so that it can enumerate the keys that are available to it and read the appropriate key uh, for uh, at execution time. And we'll show you where that lights up inside of Synapse. Alrighty, so let's switch over to the demo. Okay, so in this demo, the first thing I wanted to show you was the data that we're gonna be looking at and working with. What we have here is a CSV file that's loaded up with uh, bike reviews. What you see here is on each row, we'll have a model that the review is for, some star ratings, an overall title, but the most important thing that we care about here is there's a blob of text that is the what was input. Now, we get a lot of bike reviews, and the bike reviews that we really care about are the negative ones so that we can respond to them. And so what we want to do is quickly score these so that we can look at the overall sentiment across the line of bikes, but more importantly, find the negative views really quickly instead of having somebody look at them one by one. So we're going to use the sentiment analysis API of cognitive services in order to do this. So this CSV file that we're looking at here has already been uploaded into our Synapse environment. Um, and this is our default storage container. And for our purposes, we've just put it at the root of that default storage container. So in order to leverage this, there's a couple things that I want to show you first. I want to first show you what calling the Cognitive Services API looks like natively. So popping over to this Jupyter Notebook, I have, oh, not this Jupyter Notebook, popping over to this Jupyter Notebook, we have a couple of cells here that do some really basic code. The first thing we're going to do is load the azure.ai-ai-text analytics library using the pip command. And this loads in all the dependencies so that we can do text analytics. And then we have some really basic code here. You can see I've got a key to the API. I've got the endpoint URL for that API. And then I also have a few lines of code here that basically just create a credential object, create an instance of the text, uh, the text client, the text analytics client, and then we create an inline document and call that API. And you'll see the result of making this call is really quickly, it gives us the language French. So it's detected this is a French language. So it seems pretty straightforward, not a lot of code in order to do this. But I'll challenge you, one of the things that you need to think about when you're working in something like Synapse or another Spark environment, you're probably working with large sets of data and not making singleton calls like this. And so if you think about it, let's say I had a large CSV file with many rows in it, and each individual row was another call to the API, that could get pretty tedious really quickly. I'd have to write some code to iterate over all the, all the rows in the data frame. I'd have to pull out the individual column. I'd have to create the appropriate payload. I'd have to make the API call, and I'd have to do that over and over and over. Uh, more importantly, you need to think about the fact that what if I needed to call multiple APIs? How do I stitch that together? And also, each one of these APIs is going to have limits for the number of concurrent calls that you can make, um, how many documents you might be able to press, uh, pass in a certain call. And then after, if you're passing multiple documents in one call, you'd also need to correlate the results and stitch those back to the individual rows. I'm um, just talking through that. I'm getting exhausted. So you can see that that would be pretty complex to do. 
not impossible, but it's a lot of extra work. And that's where the magic of Synapse ML comes in, is it makes this process pretty easy in that it does a lot of those value added wrappers for you by being able to turn your calls into batches, being able to correlate the results back to the individual rows that they came from, et cetera. And we'll show you what that looks like here. But I just wanted to give you a taste of what the calling the cog services API in Python looks like. All right, so there's two ways that we're gonna look at how do we call cognitive services APIs here with Synapse ML. The first one is this nice little accelerator that is built into the Synapse workspace that saves you from having to learn how to write this code yourself. And then the second one is we'll go straight to the code and do that. Um, right, so this first one has got a couple dependencies and I need to show you what those dependencies are first. Um, it's going to leverage something in Synapse parlance which is called a link service. So I need to go in here into the manage area in Synapse and look at link services. And you can see inside of links, inside of Synapse, I've got a key vault link service and a cognitive services link service. I need both of these things. Um, the reason I need both of these things is the cognitive services link service depends upon the key vault link service. So this key vault link service, you can see it points to my key vault environment. It's connecting with my system managed identity and um, that's about it. That's all it really needs to know. In the cognitive service, I'm going to point back to my specific cognitive service API here, and then I'm telling it what my key vault link service is, and then I'm giving it the secret name where the key is stored. So this is what I talked about earlier, where you don't have to throw your key in line like I showed you in that last example. This pulls the key out at runtime, and it's all wrapped up in these link services. This can all be done in code as well, but the link services make it, uh, you know, make it easier from an administration standpoint and using the GUI editors inside of Synapse. Now, when I've got those two things taken care of, I also need something in Synapse that's called a lake database. And we've got another session elsewhere on lake databases. If you want to find out more about that, that's great. But I just want to go into this really quickly and show you. Um, inside your data workspace, earlier I was in the link services area where I was showing you storage. We also have this lake databases area here, and I can come out here and say uh, new lake database. And when I create a new lake database, it takes me to this wizard where I can name my database and I can choose my tables. Um, and I can do tables from templates. So if there's a well-known industry template that you want to use, we have a lot of templates out there. Or I can do straight from the data lake. In this case, you know, I'll create a new table. This is just a demo. I've already got it created, but I want to show it to you pick my link service. This is my storage link service that I'm coming from um, that was created by default when I created my Synapse environment. And then I can choose the folder where my data is. And oops, I went one too far. Pick my bike reviews here. And this will go ahead and create this environment for me. It's going to go look at the file. It's going to examine its schema. It's going to try to infer its schema. And then I can come in here and do things like override what the delimiter is, whether or not there's column names in the first row. Is there some sort of a string qualifier? Like this would handle things like if you have commas in fields, um, et cetera. And I can, I can do all that stuff. I'm going to bail out of here because I've already done this um, and show you the database one that I created previously. And you can see I have this here. And you can see my bike reviews table. And it's got four columns in it. And the review column is the one that we really care about. OK, so I have all the prerequisites. I have the lake database created, which you can see over here on the left nav. I've got tables. I've got a bike reviews table. I've got the Azure Key Vault link service. And I've got the Azure Cognitive Service link service. This is important because now, when I have this lake database table here, I can go and right click and say machine learning. Um, if I wanted to do other things like kick off a notebook, it would create a notebook with a new uh, load to data frame snippet of code in there, or I could go straight into querying this with a SQL serverless endpoint. But in our case, what I'm going to do is predict with a model. And this predict with a model is going to give me a couple things that I can choose that are pre-built accelerators for a couple really common cognitive services things. The first one we're not going to go into here, but this is an anomaly detector, so I could look for anomalous values in a set of values. Um, or in this particular case, sentiment analysis, which we talked about, I'm going to click continue. It's going to ask me where my cognitive service link services, which we've already created. It's going to ask me what the language I'm expecting is, is English. And it's also going to give, tell me what column I want to apply this to. With that, I click Open Notebook. And what does it do? It generates this code for me. And you can see, pretty straightforward, but quite a bit different than the code that I showed you earlier. And the reason for that is this is using the 
the wrappers in the synapse.ml.cognitive that are wrapping a lot of those calls to doing the authentication against the cognitive service and, um, and then dealing with row batches, et cetera. All right, so I have one that's already been run here. It's the same code, it's identical, you can see, but just uh, since the Spark session has already started, it'll be a little faster over here. I run this cell and you can run the cell with shift enter or by clicking the plus button on the side here. And you can see it's actually gone through. It's taken the, the data out. It's created an error column in case there were errors, but it's gonna be undefined on all the rows because there were no errors. And it's stuck the, it's reviewed the review column and it's actually stuck the sentiment um, output column here. And so you can see I've done some processing on the results where I've pulled up just the column sentiment from this output.document.sentiment. Um, so the output column is output column and I've pulled out these three columns and you can see I've got the, the sentiment on each row. Okay, so that shows you the integrated experience, but what if you need to do a little bit more, right? What if you want to deal with this as a multi-step process? Uh, what if you don't want to create these link services and you want to be able to do your um, your data engineering by reading directly off the data lake without having to set up a lake database? Well, you can do that as well. Um, and I have another example here that shows you I've really addressed two problems here. The first problem is I didn't want to create the lake database. Um, I didn't want to uh, create the link services. I wanted to call out to Key Vault directly from my Spark code. Um, I can do all of that here. In addition, I'm doing something that's called a, a, a multi-stage pipeline. So not only did I want to score a sentiment on the text, but um, we get text we get text in multiple languages. And what I wanted to be able to do was translate the review to English for our customer service people so that they could read what the review was and correlate and say, hey, this is a negative view, but it's negative, what did they say, right? And so let's take a look at the code here. So this is a little bit more involved. And the reason it's a little bit more involved is I set up some scaffolding code here in, in the beginning. I'm doing some stuff to do column manipulation. Um, I also had to pull in some extra utilities to do things like making the call out to Key Vault. And then I set a bunch of parameters up here in the beginning, uh, set up things for my storage account um, that we, wouldn't, we didn't need with the lake database and where the container the data is. And like I said, the reason for this is we're not using the lake database to query things. We're going directly against the Azure storage account. Down here, this is pretty straightforward cell. All it does is it um, uh, connects together the container name, and the storage account name to get to this file that we care about. You can see the bike reviews.csv. And when we execute this, you'll see that we get the same data out here. We see the model, we see the title, we see the review. And then if we scroll way down into the view, oh, I'm only showing a limit 10 on that, I'm sorry. Um, the next cell, what we're doing here is we're uh, doing what's called a, a pipeline model. So this pipeline model does a couple of things here. You can see we've got the text sentiment call very similar to what you saw earlier except instead of yet setting the, the, the cognitive link service, we're using a set subscription key. And by passing that key in there and the service location, now when we call this get credentials, this credentials got get secret, it's going out to the call key vault and getting that value um, from the key vault interactively at runtime without having to use that link service. And so we call the text sentiment API and we also call the translate API, and it's gonna be doing this in this batch transformation. So it's gonna be running these things in parallel. And so you'll see what our results look like. Now here, all we've done is we've taken the sentiment result and put it in the sentiment, uh, taken the result from the sentiment API and put it in the sentiment result column. And we've taken the result from the translation API or, and put it in the translation column. And you can see what these payloads look like when they come back. It's actually a JSON body. So if we expand this out here, you can see the sentiment result. It's got a JSON document. Inside the document, it's got sentences. And each sentence will have its own positive, negative, neutral review. If we wanted to get down to that level of granularity, we could. And also, we have an overall sentiment for the document. So this works really well for those scenarios where you have a really long review. It could be mixed sentiment. It could say, hey, this thing's really good and this thing's really bad. And so you might need that level of, level of granularity. But in this particular case, we're just going to look at the overall sentiment being positive. Um, it also has confidence scores for the sentiment. So it says, hey, we're 99% positive that it's 
or 99 percent sure that it's positive one percent neutral zero percent negative so that might be interesting as well so you want to look at the negative ones with high confidence not the negative ones with middling confidence and you can do that as well and then the translation similar um, output here except it tells us what the detected language was on the source document english and then translation obviously it didn't need to translate this because it was already in english but if you go down here and scroll through, I think it'll jump out pretty quickly, but we have some reviews out here in other languages. I know we have some Spanish reviews. Um, yeah, see so your Fantastica Bicicleta. Um, if you expand this one out, you could see the detected language was Spanish and it's translated to English and you can see the translated English text here. So when we run this pipeline, it's going to, it's going to uh, get res do both the sentiment and the translation. And then at the end, if we needed to do some post-processing on that, you can see that we've uh, created some new columns in the data set. We've added a sentiment column by extracting the sentiment. We've also uh, pulled out the three varying confidence score degrees. And finally, we've overwritten the, trans the review column with the translated text. So we only really care about the translation, not the original text in this case. And you can see what that looks like. So then when I scroll down here and we find that Spanish translation, I didn't translate the title intentionally, so it would jump out very quickly. Um, yeah, so you can see Fantastica Bicicleta, and then it says this bike is just stunning, et cetera. And so you can see it's done a, done a really good translation there and put that in line in the resulting data set. So now the users that look at this data, we can move on the pipeline, publish it to the destination, and then users can come and consume this data and they can do reviews, you know, an average sentiment by bike model, um, filter on star count, et cetera. And so this really shows how we can take that source data, move it through a multi-stage process, and then output the resulting data at the end. And I know that I just showed the results of my demonstration here, uh, but I promise you um, it runs uh, and I can click a run all now and you'll see the results um, and it'll actually do all that stuff interactively as I spoke about. Um, the reason I went through the results here is it's just going to take a minute for my Spark session to, to spin up and I didn't want to, I didn't want that to wait for that to happen interactively. So hopefully you found that demo interesting and you're thinking of areas where you can deploy this in your own environments. To summarize, uh, Synapse ML makes operationalizing AI and machine learning within your uh, Spark environments uh, very easy. It accelerates a lot of the things, the tedious things that make, uh, make doing those calls out to services like cognitive services complicated. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a whole heck of a lot more to Synapse ML than cognitive services. Uh, as we mentioned, um, there are uh, rich libraries in there for building your own machine, building and operationalizing your own machine learning models. And most importantly, Synapse ML can be run anywhere where you can run Spark. So don't think that just because I demonstrated Synapse today that this is the only way to do it. You can leverage, leverage this in your Databricks environments, um, outside of Azure, on-premises, even in your own Docker containers. So a few resources to point out. Um, I've included here links to the overall documentation and samples for Synapse ML. There's lots of great examples out there how to call other cognitive services. In addition, uh, samples, scenarios that shows, uh, you know, multi-service pipelines like I demonstrated today and building and training your own models. Um, I've also included the links to top level, top level documentation on uh, the cognitive services in Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, this includes some, some tutorials and some documentation on the things that I showed you, the accelerator for generating the, synapse, uh, generating the sentiment analysis code, and then some top level documentation on cognitive services in general. And then finally, as I mentioned, this GitHub repo uh, is where I've shared uh, all the code today, I've shared the sample files that I leverage for my demos, and also I've included a markdown file or a readme file that's got all of the step-by-step -step, uh, information on how to set up and configure this in your own environment. So with that, we are done. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this vignette, and just keep in mind that you can find out sessions like this and other vignettes uh, on aka.ms slash MAA. Thanks for joining us today.